evolution. You can see that word. I don't want you to embarrass yourself if you believe in that stupid doctrine. I won't tell anybody if you don't tell anybody because I don't want you to make a fool of yourself. You do believe in evolution? <laughs> I, I hate to sound sarcastic, but all I can do is laugh at the stupidity. Do you know in your eye, that little thing the size of a ping pong ball, among other things, there's 137 million light sensitive receptors, 130 million to do one thing, uh, we're talking about color and then black and white, seven million. For, did that all happen by chance? And do you know that science in a provable law, evolution's not provable, in a provable law makes it clear that evolution cannot be true. It's called the law of entropy or the second law of thermodynamics. And it says this, that anything left to itself will deteriorate or we would say, go to pot. What does that mean? Well, if we were supposed to have started from a little speck on some beach somewhere and then developed and finally come into monkeys and apes and then human beings, science says that couldn't happen because if it's left on its own, it will what? It will deteriorate. If you don't look after your car and leave it for 10 years, never get it serviced or anything, will it get better? Will it look like a brand new car or will it deteriorate? If you don't paint your house once in a while, it will deteriorate. If you don't look after your yard, it'll get worse and worse and worse. That's basic law. We all know that. In fact, it says, science says this, science says, the only way that anything, listen to it, could improve instead of getting worse is with the interjection of an outside intelligence. Wow. So if there's no God, but there's only evolution, you can't go up the way, you can't improve, you can only deteriorate. I want to read you some things about Charles Darwin. It's from a little book that I wrote many years ago called I Can Prove There Is a God. The following account is told by Lady Hope of Northfield, England, a wonderful Christian woman who was often at the side of Charles Darwin at his bedside before he passed away. It was on a glorious autumn afternoon that we sometimes enjoy in England, she says, when I was asked to go and sit with Charles Darwin. I used to feel when I saw him that his fine presence would make a grand picture for our Royal Academy. But never did I think so more strongly than on this particular occasion. He was sitting up in bed, propped up with pillows. Now, you, you got to hear this about Charles Darwin. Gazing out on a far-stretching scene of woods and uh, over fields which glowed in the light of a marvelous sunset. His features lit up with pleasure as I entered the room. He waved his hand toward the window as he pointed out the beautiful sunset scene beyond, while in the, in the other he held an open Bible, which he was always studying, Charles Darwin. What are you reading now, I ask? Hebrews, he said, the book of Hebrews. It's the royal book, I call it, Charles Darwin said. Then he placed his fingers on certain passages and he commented on them to me. I made some allusions to the strong opinions expressed by many on the history of creation and then their treatment of the earlier chapters of the book of Genesis. He seemed distressed. His fingers twitched nervously and a look of agony came across his face as he said, you know, I was just a young man with unformed ideas. I threw out some queries, some suggestions, wondering all the time about everything. And to my astonishment, and the ideas took on like wildfire. People, people, other people made a religion out of them. Then he paused and after a few more sentences on the holiness of God and the grandeur of this book, Looking tenderly at the Bible, which he was holding all the time, he said, 
I have a summer house in the garden which holds about 30 people. It was over there pointing out through the open window. I want very much to, I want you, he said, very much to speak at that spot. I know you can read the Bible in the villages. Tomorrow afternoon, however, I should like the servants of this place, some tenants and a few neighbors together there. Will you speak to them at that point? What shall I speak about, I ask? Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. He replied in a clear, emphatic voice, adding in a lowering tone, and his salvation. Is not that the best theme? And then I want you to sing some hymns with them. You lead on your small instrument, don't you? The look of brightness on his face I shall never forget. For he added, If you make the meeting at three o'clock, this window will be open, and you will know that I am joining in the singing about the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do they never print that part in the textbook for schools? I just got one last thing to say. This is a huge subject. Let's say you invited me to be your guest, and I stayed in your home overnight, and I was up before you. I came downstairs, I was sleeping upstairs, and so were you, and we had our bedrooms, and we came downstairs, and on the table, I had, let's, let's just say, like a glass bowl, a round glass, and in it, there were all kinds of little, almost bubbles of glass, and they were all floating about, floating. It was a marvelous looking structure, floating about, and I was looking at it, and you came in, and you said to me, where did that come from? That's an amazing, that's a beautiful looking thing. Where did it come from? And I said to you, oh, oh it didn't come from anywhere. It just, it just happened overnight. Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid, that's what you would say. Isn't it a creation of some genius? How did you do that? Where, where did you get this from? If it's a creation, there has to be a creator. It doesn't make sense, friends, to say something evolved just because you don't want to admit there's a God who's the creator of all. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created. The word is bara in the Hebrew and contains the idea that he can create something out of nothing. Creatio ex nihilo, it's in the Latin. Don't be, I don't want to be unkind, but I got to get you between the eyes. Don't be a blooming idiot and believe this stupidity of evolution. Acknowledge that there's a creator to such a magnificent creation, and God will bless you. Give up the stupidity of evolution and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.